I'm wearing a genuine shirt from Samoa, which is a long way away. My daughter brought this back for me. It's in the South Pacific, about a 20, 20 hour flight from here. And uh, so this is a, a very common thing to be worn. Um, don't be confused, I'm not Samoan. I know I resemble someone who might be of Samoan descent. It's just the shirt. <laughs> But you know, this uh, series that we have been continuing in the book of Acts is all about the good news of Jesus Christ, which started in the area of Israel and Jerusalem, this remote hovel that was disrespected and really not cared that much about in the Roman Empire, not just remaining, though it started with one people group and one language and one history, but from the very beginning, God's plan was for that to reach into all peoples, in all cultures, in all times. And so that's a lot what the book of Acts is about. is about how the Holy Spirit working through and in the lives of regular, ordinary people, the Holy Spirit given when someone believes and trusts in Jesus Christ to be the forgiver of their sins and the leader of their life, and to follow him, this Holy Spirit gives people the ability to do better and more than they've done before, to love better, to be more truthful, to have more resolve when things get difficult. There's a, there's a power, or an energy, there's the resurrection life of Jesus dwelling in a human being by faith, and it changes the world from one person at a time from the inside out. Um, think about it this way. Um, in the sport of boxing, they divide you according to weight classes because it's really not fair for someone who weighs 200 pounds to fight someone who weighs 150 pounds because the power that can be generated by the larger person is substantial. And so if you want to pay a fighter a compliment about their ability, you say he or she punches above his or her weight. In other words, their punching ability is much better than, or much bigger than their size. Think about it this way. The Holy Spirit living within us, the Spirit of Jesus, gives us the ability to punch above our weight in terms of love, compassion, truthfulness, integrity, all the things that are necessary for successful relationships in the family, in our schools, in our places of work, in our community. And so that's what we have been looking at as this plan unfolds on how God helped these people that, just like us, can be focused on our own little world and our culture and our interests and the things that we know are most important in all that matters. And God was trying to expand the vision of the people to embrace people different so that God's family could grow to encompass all people. So that's the good news of Jesus in the book of Acts, and we're already in chapter 21. And um, if you have an outline uh, that you may have downloaded from the website, pull that out, or you can follow on the screen. But we are going to continue, and we've been dividing Acts into chapters or groupings of seven. This new life that came into the world, the first seven chapters, new life taking root, the next seven chapters, this new life reaching out beyond that one people group. And now we're finishing up the new life building bridges to people in different cultures. So that's where we are in Acts 21. Um, I'm going to pray for us, and I invite you to pray along with me. And then we'll get into the text of the message, this good news of Jesus. Let's pray together. Lord, whether we're here on site or whether we're online, um, watching it live at this very moment, or perhaps at another time that's uh, more convenient. Um, it doesn't matter. Lord, through the, the miracle of your Holy Spirit and through the blessing of technology, Lord, we are able to encounter your living and active word that you've given us in the Bible, and it can encounter us. And so, Lord, we ask and we invite you, wherever we're at, wherever we're at physically, and wherever we're at spiritually or emotionally or whatever right now, that you would meet us where we're at. And that you would allow your words of life to wash over us, give us strength where we need it, 
give us encouragement, perhaps correct us and give us a nudge forward. Lord, you know how things have been going for us. Lord, you know what's around the corner for us, things that we may be worried or concerned about or things that we have no idea. You know how to prepare us for what's ahead. Thank you that the scriptures say that these words are living and active and have been for generations and generations and generations. So Lord, speak to us now through your living and active word. Help me to be a usable vehicle and may we all be encouraged and blessed. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. We're going to talk this morning about finding strength in Jesus' purposes. We'll often go to a lot of different places to find strength. You know, you can go to the gym to find strength. Um, you know, you, there's a lot of places to go to find strength. Jesus' larger and greater purposes are an excellent source of strength. And what we see in this chapter, in Acts chapter 21, is the Apostle Paul and how he as he participates in Jesus' purposes, the strength of God comes to him. And it's a good and helpful reminder to us in 21st century. Even though this happened centuries ago, people are people. And God is building his family and building his kingdom and encouraging and strengthening regular human beings like Paul and you and I even today. So again, Acts 21 but before we touch on Acts 21, we need a little context, a little reminder. You know, the Bible was meant to not be just taken a chunk at a time um, and then separate and not think about it for a week and then come back to another chunk. It's meant to be kind of read through. So whenever we start, we like to touch base on where we have been. And there's two references in Acts chapter 19 and one in Acts 20 that just give us the context of what's going on. Paul, though he was in Ephesus, modern-day Turkey, got direction from the Holy Spirit twice that is mentioned. So let's just read that. In Acts 19, verse 21, it says that Paul decided in the Spirit, put together, he decided in the Holy Spirit to go on to Jerusalem, passing through Macedonia and Achaia. And after I've been there, he said, I must visit Rome also. So at some point in Paul's relationship with God and through the Holy Spirit in prayer and listening to God, the Holy Spirit put it on Paul's heart, it's about time for you to go to Jerusalem. You have been away from Jerusalem for a significant amount of time, bringing the good news. It's time for you to go back. The Holy Spirit guided and instructed Paul according to the scriptures. Continuing on in Acts 20, a chapter later, in verse 22 through 24, it says, Compelled by the Spirit, this is Paul speaking, Compelled by the Spirit, I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I have this sense from the Spirit that I need to go to Jerusalem, but I don't know exactly what's going to happen. Holy Spirit hasn't rolled out the whole map and said, This is exactly what's going to happen. Point. No, you just need to go there, Paul, and trust me by faith. And so not knowing what will happen to me there, I only know this, that in every city, the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. My only aim is that I finish the race, that I complete the task that the Lord Jesus has given me, the task of testifying to the good news of God's grace. How does that help you, how does that help me? Paul says some powerful things there. In a sense, for a second, it's, you know, he's, he's got threats ahead of him. He knows there's going to be resistance. The possibility of prison is very strong. He's faced all kinds of things that were worse. If the Spirit says go to Jerusalem and he knows what's possible there, he says, you know what, I don't let that fear control me. That is a reality, but there's a greater reality with me, within me, and that is wanting to be guided by God's Spirit and that my life would show and demonstrate the love of Christ. And so he's not saying, my life is unimportant to me. I don't care about myself. And then in a relationship with God that you, you don't care about yourself and you do just whatever. No, what he's saying here is that I have a thought out, 
and chosen priority that is right through the center of my life. And that well thought out and chosen priority is this, is that I will follow Jesus where and how the Spirit guides me. And I will share Jesus over and above pursuing personal success, safety, comfort, or status. I will follow this Jesus. I will share this Jesus, and that is what drives me over and above any success I could accumulate, safety that I could have for myself, or comfort or status. So again, Paul values his life. He's just saying there's a priority, and I want my life to show Jesus to the world. And he uses that very powerful imagery I'm going to finish the race. If you start in a race, whether it's a 100-yard sprint or a, a mile or whether it's a marathon, the key is to finish. Half-finished projects don't usually amount to much. Paul says, I want to finish the race that God has put me on. I want to complete the task. And notice in his wording, he says, I want to complete the task that the Lord has given me. Notice, the Holy Spirit guided him and helped him in his decision process to go to Jerusalem and, and also put Rome in his mind, which that's farther out in the future. And then at the end, when he's talking about this passion, how he wants his life to be about sharing Jesus and about following Jesus, he says, this is the task that the Lord has given me. See, as human beings, we need to watch out and be careful because our normal tendency is to, we want to give Jesus tasks. We want to give God tasks. Hey, this is how I want things to work out. This is what I want my life to be about. God, Jesus, could you make that happen for me right now, preferably? See, that's our, that's our problem. We think we, we would never say it. That I'm God, and hey, Jesus, would you help me accomplish my purposes and my ends? We would never say I'm God. No human says that. But that's kind of what's at the root. And so Paul's like, I want my life to be about Jesus, and I'll be his instrument in the world, wherever he places me, rather than I'm going to try and capture Jesus or capture God and make him my personal attendant. So, what's the takeaway for us modern people? Listen responsibly. We need to do a better job of listening responsibly to the Holy Spirit's mission and focus. You have spheres of influence that God has placed you in families, in schools, in places of work, in communities, in neighborhoods. You have a sphere, many spheres of influence that you're part of. And if you and I are listening to the Holy Spirit responsibly, we will be utilizing those spheres of influence, to serve people in Jesus' name, to point people to Jesus, to recognize that my life is not my own. I'm a representative of Jesus in these spheres of influence. And to do that, we have to listen responsibly. Deciding in the Holy Spirit, as Paul, compelled by the Holy Spirit in verses 21 and 22. And that requires you and I to slow down a little bit, take time to pray, and ask for God's guidance regularly, not just to accomplish our to-do list. God cares about our to-do list and the things that concern us. But how often do we pray and kind of open our hands and open our spirit before God and say, You know what, God? Lead me this week. Help me find your way and to make a difference in my sphere of influence, the places that you've put me. So we need to listen responsibly to the Holy Spirit. That's what we see Paul doing. It translates into our world as well. Continuing on, we're now into the focus of the chapter, Acts 21. And what Paul has done is he's, the last week we saw that Paul was kind of passing the torch to the Ephesian elders. Uh, had been in Ephesus for over two years, helping to plant and establish a church in a community. And now it was time to move on. And so they had a strong connection. But he couldn't stay there. They were going to have to stand on their own two feet now. And in verse 1, it describes, it helps us understand how this parting was difficult. And if you want to think of it in terms of modern day situations, you know, what some of the terrible things that people go through now is that they have older loved ones that are in a, um, a 
care facility and you, you say goodbye to them and you can't see them, you can't encounter them. Or if you know that you visit someone, a family member or a friend for a long time and you're not going to see them for years and years. That's what's going on here. And in verse 1 it says, After we, this is Luke writing, meaning we, meaning Paul and his team, after we had torn ourselves away. What imagery? After we had torn ourselves away from the leaders of the church in Ephesus, we put out to sea for Jerusalem. And after passing to the south of Cyprus, we sailed to Syria and landing at Tyre to unload the ship and the cargo. We sought out the disciples that were there and we stayed with them for seven days. And through the Spirit, they urged Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. Continuing on, we continued our voyage from Tyre and we landed at Tom, <laughs> not getting it. Tomaeus. I might be wrong with that. But anyway, it's the second place they stopped. Tyre was first, Tomaeus was second, where we greeted the believers that were there, and we stayed with them for a day. And then leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea, and we stayed in the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven. Okay, so we're seeing them. As they're on their way to Jerusalem, the ultimate goal, they're stopping at different places, different towns, and they are visiting, they are connecting with, and saying that they're staying with different groups of people that they've perhaps never met before. Circle if you're following with an outline or if you see it up there, circle in your mind. This, we tore ourselves away. There was a care, there was a love, there was a connection that was forged with these believers in Ephesus that we ought to take to heart. Oftentimes we can get running around here and there with our to-do list and often give short attention to meaningful, significant relationships, whether it's in a church community, in our neighborhood, in our own families. There was a strong connection. It was hard to separate. And then when they went to these places along the way, it says we stayed with them. We stayed with them seven days. We stayed with them a night or two. What's that about? Think about it this way. They chose to share life. They chose to share life with these people in these fellow believers that they may have not known well at all. They shared life with the people in Tyre. They shared life with the people in Tomaeus. They shared life with the people in Caesarea. And they shared life together with Philip. Sharing life together, sharing friendship together, they gave and they received hospitality from one another. And there's a blessing, there's a strengthening in that. There's a strength that can be imparted to you. There's a strength that you can give in the context of meaningful, loving, affirming relationships that is significant and hugely important. Don't allow the pace of your life and the length of your to-do list to slowly squish out meaningful conversation. Or I know it's harder now with COVID and mask wearing and encounters. It's harder now. We're going to have to work harder. But meaningful relationship, sharing life is so important. And so the takeaway for us is give of yourself in friendships and hospitality. Years and years and years ago, Laura and I were newly married and in a town that we didn't know that well, we didn't grow up in. We were part of a church, and an important part of this church was there was a couple in particular that would go out of their way to invite a few other couples um, when church was over to whether grab lunch out or grab lunch at their house or just finding a way to connect in some way so that there was a connection. This last Friday, some friends in our neighborhood kind of unexpectedly, maybe Wednesday or Thursday, hey, why don't you come down to our house on Friday and you can share our patio with us and we'll provide snacks and we can have some beverages and we can just hang out. You know, you get running, running, running. And it was hard to get there by six because sometimes it's hard to shut it off. But it was a delightful evening and all of a sudden it's like, oh, it's 9.30. You know, time to be in bed. <laughs> I know, you 20-year-olds, your 30-year-olds are like, oh, that's so sad. <laughs> but it's real. <laughs> it was a delightful evening. Make time. 
for meaningful relationships to share and to give hospitality. There's a strengthening that happens when you just share life together. Give of yourselves, give of ourselves in friendships and hospitality. You see it here as they're on their way to Jerusalem. So listen responsibly to the Holy Spirit so that we pay attention to the mission and focus. Give of ourselves in friendships and hospitality. And we move on now to verse 10. After we had been with Philip, remember they stayed at Philip's house for a night. And after we had been with Philip a number of days, so they stayed a while, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. And coming over to us, he took Paul's belt. I think my pants will stay up. He took Paul's belt. And it says... Oops. I forgot the microphone was attached to the belt. Well, we'll make it work. He took Paul's belt and tied his own hands with the belt and his own feet with the belt. I have no idea how he did that, but he did it. I'm not going to demonstrate that. And he said this in the presence of the others and Paul. So the Holy Spirit is telling me this. That in this same way, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem, where you are going, will bind the owner of this belt and hand him over to the Gentiles. When we heard this, you know, Luke is talking here, at least. When we heard this, we and the people that were there pleaded with Paul, don't go to Jerusalem. You don't want to be bound up hand and foot. Don't go to Jerusalem. And Paul answered, why are you weeping? Why are you breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. And when he would not be dissuaded, we gave up. And we said, the Lord's will be done. Now it's interesting here, it says that Agabus was speaking by the Holy Spirit. So was the Holy Spirit trying to dissuade and trying to you know, get Paul away from Jerusalem? And Paul was just not listening and rigid and obstinate. No, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Perhaps not. Perhaps part of what the Holy Spirit's job is to help us know what's coming, help us prepare, or to be us in that situation where I have a choice to make here. And maybe the choice is a hard choice. As you read through this, you cannot help but see the parallels between what's going on here with Paul as he's preparing to go to Jerusalem and Jesus' final march to Jerusalem before he was crucified. People were saying, don't go, don't go. It's going to be a problem, it's going to be a problem. Same. Paul says, I'm ready, not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Following God seriously, following Jesus seriously, is not about a personal death wish. Paul does not desire to just be dead for, for any reason. He's saying, no, again, that underlying purpose, that priority that we talk, I want my life to show and to demonstrate Jesus. And if I run from this difficulty that's ahead of me, that doesn't show Jesus at all. There were other times in Paul's ministry where people warned him and he, he left before he could be, it wasn't his time. So, the takeaway for us, resolve, resolve, resolve now, resolve today to follow Jesus even in great difficulty. Your life as it is right now, you've probably already encountered various levels of great difficulty. Guess what? Chances are there's also great difficulty ahead for you. Let's decide today that whatever difficulty may come our way, be it financial, be it relational, be it medical or health, be it all the different ways difficulties can come our way. Let's resolve now and today that, you know what, I'm going to follow God, I'm going to follow Jesus, whatever difficulty comes my way. And you know what, I might even follow Jesus into difficulty. When I know what's coming ahead of me, I'm still going to go. Paul had made the decision ahead of time. 
You and I need to make, you know, when, when a relationship gets tough or when a job gets tough, I'm going to stick it out. I'm going to honor my commitment to Jesus in this particular context. I guess I did need it. <laughs> All right. So listen responsively to the Holy Spirit. Make time for it. Also, carve out time for friendships and to experience and to give and to offer and to share hospitality and resolve that however, whatever difficulty, I'm not going to give up on God. Because that's a default that happens to people sometimes. Believers and, you know, when life goes south, when life goes sour, oh, this following God, this is not doing any good. You know, we get really pragmatic. You know, it's, you, know, you know, we would never say, I only worship God, or I only pretend to follow God, or I only go to church so that I get the circumstances out. Nobody says that. But at times when we're in pain, when we're in difficulty, we're tempted by that thought. This isn't working out. God's not really on my side, or doesn't seem to be, or maybe he's not there at all. Resolve now. Whatever difficulty. Even if it's great. Follow the Lord Jesus in the midst of that difficulty. Decide now. Paul, had, Paul did. Continuing on in verse 27. Remember they had tried to dissuade him. They said, Paul, you know, don't go, don't go, don't go. Well, now we fast forward and we can't. You'll have to read between verses 14 and 27 on your own. But essentially it's Paul arriving in Jerusalem, finally getting to the goal. And so he's in Jerusalem. Paul is a, is a, a Jew, culturally, um, ethnically. Um, he has a strong Jewish pedigree in terms of education and religion. I mean, he's, he's a power broker. He didn't grow up in Jerusalem. He was north in Tarsus. And so he has this interesting combination of a Greek background and also a Jewish background, which made him perfect for bringing the gospel well and around the Mediterranean. So he's going back now. And as a Jew, he can go to the temple. And so in verse 27, it says, Some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul in the temple, and they roused a mob against him. And then they grabbed him, and they were yelling, Men of Israel, men of Israel, help us! This is the man, this is the one that you've heard about, who preaches against, and, and notice what they call out here, they say, All around we've heard about this, he's preaching against our people. And he's preaching against our law. And he's preaching against this place, our holy place. He's our enemy. He's preaching against us as a race and as a culture. He's preaching against our law. And he's preaching against our God and the temple. And to make matters worse, he brought those who were ethnically different than us into our church. He brought Greeks into the temple. And because he brought Greeks into the temple area, he defiled the place. It's no longer clean. Now the truth of the matter was, Paul hadn't brought Greeks into the temple, because he knew what would... But they had seen Paul associating with Greeks in the marketplace, and so they fabricated this, that he brought them into the temple. But anyway... says the whole city, verse 30, the whole city was rocked by these accusations, the whole city of Jerusalem, and a great riot followed as they were trying to, I mean, are you seeing some of the parallels and some of the stuff that's been going on? The Bible is rock solid, spot on, and will always continue. Jesus said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Brought those people into our space. We need to do something about this. He's against us as a culture. He's against our religious stuff. He's against... And so the city is rocked by these accusations, some, many of them false, and a great riot followed. And as they were trying to kill Paul, word reached the commander of the Roman regiment. Because remember, Israel is no longer its own nation. 
It's occupied by the dominant Roman power, and so they're allowed to be their nation, but they're under control and subjugation, and there are Roman forces there to enforce Roman law and to keep the peace. And so as this group of persons are trying to kill Paul, responding to these rumors and these accusations that aren't true, because remember, Paul's not preaching against the Jewish people. He's not preaching against the Jewish law. He's not preaching against the temple. The good news of Jesus Christ merely says that Jesus is the fulfillment of all that you hope for that's part of your culture. All that you hope for, and that this Jesus is superior to any ritual or tradition, superior to anything else, that's all. He is what you're hoping for, you just don't know it yet. You just have to bow down and acknowledge him. Not trying to destroy and so the Roman commander gets involved because he's in charge of keeping the peace. In verse 32, he immediately called out his soldiers and officers ran down amongst the crowd. And as Paul reached the stairs, the mob grew so violent that the soldiers had to lift Paul up over their heads so that the people couldn't get at him in order to protect him. The people hated Paul that much. The mob had just grown out of control. And the only thing that saved Paul, by God's grace, the Roman army was there. They protected him. And the crowd followed behind, shouting, Kill him! Kill him! Boy, that sounds a lot like, Crucify him! Crucify him! Doesn't it? And as Paul was about to be taken inside, inside the safety of the Roman garrison, he said to the commissioner, Can I have a word with you? Can I please have a word with you? And then, we didn't have enough room on the page, but there's this little conversation where he's like, do you speak Greek? Do you speak German? Okay, so we can talk in the common language. And basically, the Roman commander asks Paul a question. He says, aren't you an Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists in the desert? And Paul's like, uh, no. Um, I'm a Jew, and I'm from Tarsus. I just want to talk about Jesus. He says, could I do that, please? He said, I have more in common with these people than they realize. And he asked him, can I please talk? And chapter 22 is, he lets him. And he speaks to the people, to the crowd that's trying to tear him apart and to kill him. So what can we learn from this? Well, Jesus is the fulfillment, whether a person is religious or not, whether a person has any kind of background in the Bible or any of the... Jesus is the fulfillment of whatever somebody longs for. They just don't know it yet. Jesus is what completes that empty gnawing that's in the heart and in the mind of every human being. The love of God demonstrated through Jesus' crucifixion and his resurrection. It's made available by grace not by performance and achievement. That is the longing, that is the fulfillment that every person longs for. And so even in the midst of this riot, in the midst of these people that hated him and viewed him as an enemy and wanted to hurt him and wanted to be rid of him, Paul was able to keep his composure, keep his cool, and look for an opportunity in the midst of the stress, in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the confusion. And so the takeaway for you and I is when we're in circumstances of chaos, circumstances of confusion, circumstances of stress, whether it's exclusively with ourselves or other people that we're part of it together, find Jesus. Look for Jesus in the midst of the confusion, in the midst of the chaos, because there's an opportunity there in some way to demonstrate Jesus, peace through the composure that he gives us, perhaps Letting people know where the source of this peace is or that helping them understand that Jesus is really the fulfillment of what you long for. All the material things that you're trying to grab, not going to do it for you. They'll never be enough. A quality of relationship or a number of relationships that you really want to have, never going to do it. Status and prestige, many life experiences, though, will never be enough. There will always be the gnawing. Jesus is, and his love, is what you need, is what you want. You just don't quite know yet. There are always opportunities 
in disruption, in chaos, in confusion. We don't like disruption. We don't like disruption in our own lives. We don't like disruption in our culture. We don't like confusion and chaos. We like order. We like routine. We like pep. So when stuff gets disrupted, whether it's in our nation, in our community, or in our personal lives, in our business, we get really tense. But if we can stay focused on Jesus and look for him in the midst of the chaos and keep our heads... God will be glorified and there will be a strength that will come to us that's above and beyond. We'll be able to punch above our own weight. Let's pray. Lord, your purposes and you as the great purpose give us strength. And Lord, there's not one of us in this room who perhaps this week or certainly within the last month or so hasn't had questions or doubts in our mind, I don't know if I can do it anymore. Or I don't know if I can handle this specific situation. Or I've dropped the ball too many times and here it comes again. Lord, you are truly a source of salvation and a source of strength. And Lord, thank you that the Holy Spirit who dwells in the life of each believer by faith can give us the ability if we'll listen and be responsive. So Lord, help us to slow down and to pray. Help us to slow down and to read so that your spirit can speak to us. Lord, help us to raise and to elevate in our own lives the position of relational connections and hospitality. Yeah, there's, the to-do lists are never going to be done. So even though, let's find a way to be hospitable. hospitable. Let's find a way to reach out and build friendship. And Lord, would you help us to resolve, to decide, to choose right now that we're going to follow you even in the greatest of difficulties. We may not know what the difficulties that may come our way, but that we know that you are the anchor and that we choose today to follow you and to trust you in the midst of any difficulty. And Lord, Paul experienced that incredibly chaotic situation where he was definitely at risk. And Lord, we can be in chaotic situations all the time where we feel at risk in a wide variety of ways. Lord, would you help us to keep our heads and to look for you and to see your presence and to see your face in the situation and to be calm and to be able to be that calming influence, whether it's in a family, our work, our church, some other situation, to see you in the midst of the chaos and disruption and to trust you and to extend that peace to others. Lord, it's a long list here. Uh, we can't do it ourselves, but Lord, thank you that we don't have to. Would you help us grow in the habit of saying, Lord, I need your help. Lord, I'm open to you. Help me be your person in the spheres of influence, the blessing, the blessed places that you've put me. It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right. Next week, Acts 22. See you next time.